to Redbridge Baptist Church this morning. So glad you're here. Happy Father's Day to you guys um, to whom that applies. I join you in rejoicing in fatherhood. I want to welcome those who are visiting with us and uh, ask you to take the card right in the pew in front of you. It's in the pew in front of you. It says, we're glad you're here. Pull out that card. Complete that with the requested information and put down a prayer request if you'd like. We uh, pray for our visitors, certainly be praying for you this week, but pull out that card, complete that, place that in the offering plate a little later in the service. We'll thank the Lord for your attendance here today. Make sure also that you uh, pick up a a visitor packet from one of our ushers. has lots of information about the church and uh, material for your spiritual walk. There's a gift included. So get one of those visitor's packets. That'll be a blessing to you as well. But complete that card. Place it in the offering plate. Upcoming um, events, if you'll notice uh, in the back page of the bulletin, it says that uh, we're having a uh, church-wide, what does it actually say, Uh, church family picnic on Sunday. It's not July 1st, that's not a Sunday, but it's July 3rd. It's for the July weekend, um, for the July happening to be on Monday in a couple of weeks. But the day before, on Sunday, uh, July 3rd, We'll have the regular morning uh, Sunday school and morning service, and then immediately following the morning service, we will be out of the pavilion, uh, hot dogs, hamburgers, and, and, and all that, and you're asked to bring a side dish and a dessert. Um, now, we like uh, a side dish from every family, but we also like a dessert from every family, uh, because if you are like me, you like to graze the dessert bar. Hey, can I get a witness? Amen. <laughs> so uh, uh, we want to have a lot of that. And uh, there'll be uh, fun and games uh, for, uh, for all who, who want to participate in that. The Recreation Committee uh, is going to have some kind of a, a fun um, t- type of uh, inflatable something, I believe, for the children. Um, probably uh, we'll have more information next week, but it might involve water activities and all. So anyway, that'll go uh, until mid-afternoon, as long as you'd like to stay. There will not be an evening service that day on Sunday, July 3rd. We will be here well into the afternoon. So take note of that. Coming up in two weeks, two weeks from now, Sunday, July 3rd. Our win teams, that is sharing the gospel with those in our neighborhood, um, is this Wednesday, begins this Wednesday. You can see Ed Hudson. Where is Ed? Are you up here in the choir? Where There's Ed right up here. You can see Ed. If you have any questions about that, sharing the Lord um, on, on behalf of the church that is going out from the church, sharing Christ, sharing the gospel with those in our neighborhood. He is heading that up, um, and so talk to Ed about that. Check your bulletin for anything else uh, that might apply to you. We're going to stand now, move around, and greet one another. Greet our visitors. Let folks know you're glad they're here. i 
gathered together as the people of God on this corner. And uh, it's not just us. It's, uh, it's not about us. Of course, it's about him. But it's even uh, not about us in, an, in another sense in that uh, we are gathered to be equipped, to be challenged, to be encouraged, uh, to be uh, edified so that we can go out and be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. And we do that uh, in and through missions, in and through our own personal witness and walk uh, in this world. Uh, being uh, salt and light in a, in a corrupt uh, and uh, evil world. Folks, uh, as you know, um, it's not getting gooder and gooder, is it, <laughs> out there? Uh, it is it's getting more and more um, oppressive uh, spiritually and evil uh, openly, which means, uh, and that's not a, a doom and gloom, that's a, wow, we get to live in this age Amen. and make a difference for the gospel, for the cause of Christ. Uh, we're not around. Uh, we are way past a post-Christian culture. If there ever was one here, certainly it is not now. So, therefore, God raised you up in this hour and me to make a difference for the cause of Christ. You want to do that? I, I want to do that. I want you to do that and want to do that. And so, let's be equipped, encouraged, uh, have the batteries charged, as it were, today so that we can make, make a difference in this world. Lord, uh, you have called us toward that end. You said that, that uh, you've given the commission uh, to your leaders, your apostles, to teach them to obey all things, whatever you have commanded. And that commandment is to go and make disciples of all nations. And that would begin right here in our own Jerusalem in our own backyard in South Kansas City, reaching out uh, to uh, across the city and across the world through our missionaries. And now, in these last days, in the past year or so, reaching out online with our um, worship services, our messages uh, communicated far and wide around the globe. Um, it's an amazing day in which we live. Lord, may we never be a people who curse the darkness, but instead who shine the light, 
There's much darkness to curse. The enemy is roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. We know that. We understand that from your word. But Lord, you have come that folks may have life and have it more abundantly because we are more than conquerors uh, in Christ. And you have um, placed us, uh, seated us in heavenly places in Christ. And so our home going is secure by virtue of what you've done. So Lord, move in our hearts to live out our days in faith, trusting you, worshiping you, testifying of you, giving of our resources, our time, our talents, our treasure in service to you and to the gospel. Toward that end, bless this time that we gather. And Lord, for every father, every granddad uh, gathered, I'm so blessed to um, be called that uh, in my own life. And pray for each one here that, Lord, we would not consider it a responsibility, a calling for someone else to fulfill. But I would have a renewed vigor in my soul to continue uh, fathering, grandfathering. Uh, in all the, all the days you give me with all the breath uh, that I have. And, uh, and pray that for the dads and grandfathers here in this uh, congregation. As well as those listening by way of internet. And so use this time to uh, equip us, to challenge us to leave here making a difference for the cause of Christ in this world, in our day. Be glorified, Lord Jesus, through our lives. In your glorious name we do pray. Amen. Brother Saylor. Fathers, what a tremendous and joyful mandate we've been given to take the gospel and teach it to our children. Uh, they're the ones that are going to be going out when we're gone and continuing the great heritage of uh, worshiping God. Let's lift up praise to our Heavenly Father singing, God of our fathers.
children love to know a couple of things. Number one, who is in charge? You wouldn't think they want to know who is in charge, but they do. And they also want to know what are the rules and will they be enforced? I know that goes against everything that we're told about how to raise children these days, but that is the truth, and Scripture backs that up. We have a, a hymn that we've done, I think, a couple of times, and it, the title of it is, Oh, Father, You Are Sovereign. And it's a very strong hymn on who is in charge, and I am glad to allow, as if I'm allowing him, God being in charge. He is the one who calls the shots. It is up to us to bow before him. I would like the orchestra to play through a verse of this so we can refresh the tune in our minds and then we'll sing it together. seated. Children always want to know, uh, okay, we, we've had Mother's Day, we've had Father's Day, now when is Children's Day? Well, okay, well, let's pretend today is Children's Day. Children, I have something for you. It's in Ephesians 
chapter 6, starting verse 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And children might be going, well, boy, I didn't want to hear that this morning. I thought this was Children's Day. Well, I've got something for fathers also. In verse 4, it speaks directly to fathers. And you fathers... Do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And certainly, we uh, want to honor that as fathers. Provoking your children to wrath, um, what is that? Having been a son and having been a father for uh, 36 years now, I know that I want to know who's in charge, and I want to know what the rules are, and I want to know that they will consistently be enforced. Because isn't it when you're told the rules are one thing, and then the rules change, or they're not enforced, isn't that frustrating? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that well up within you wrath? Certainly it does. Well, we're given instruction. And, and Pastor, I know you're going to reference uh, this verse. Go ahead and uh, change the slide over to the Deuteronomy. You're familiar with this. Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, the longest part of that passage deals with instruction and giving the commandments to your children. But I think the most important part is verse 5, where it tells fathers that you'll love the Lord your God with all your mind and soul and strength. And as you're giving this instruction to your kids, and do you get the sense that fathers, you're supposed to be spending time with your kids? And you get the sense that you're supposed to be modeling what it means to love God with all of your heart and mind and, and strength. And that it's not just instruction because uh, we can teach our children to obey, but we need to teach our children to love also. Uh, our oldest son, Paul, uh, started piano lessons just like if you're a sailor kid, you start piano in first grade. And when we had in mind that uh, all our kids would take piano lessons all the way through 12th grade. Well, Paul was playing uh, French horn in the band. He was playing trumpet in the jazz band. He was playing soccer. Uh, and he had a lot of things that he was doing when, when he was in seventh grade. And he was really not... Uh, piano wasn't going too well. And so I realized that the only time he ever touched the piano was when he sat down to practice and he set the timer for the half hour. He could be two measures until the end of the song, and if the egg timer went ding, I cannot touch the piano until tomorrow at 4.30. And, and he, he would, he would play the piano when he was on recital, and it occurred to me that he never wandered in to the living room and sat down at the piano and said, I'm going to make some music. And fathers, that's the way our instruction in the things of the Lord can be, too, if we are looking to get them to obey, and we clap ourselves on the back saying, Oh, my uh, child obeyed. He's a, a very obedient child. But if there's no loving of the Lord and we're not modeling it, we're, all we're doing is really making 
a robot. We want to demonstrate, and fathers, we need to demonstrate in our lives love for Christ as well as obedience to him because this is relationship. We tell, our, uh, we tell each other, this is a relationship we have with the Lord. Do we demonstrate that love relationship, spending time with him, looking into his word and seeing what he has for us today? We need to be about doing that because we love him because he first loved us. Stand with me as we sing how deep the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to win a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which mar the sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this thankful for that reminder that what you have done, what you did on the cross in, in first coming, living a perfect life, tempted in all points as we are yet without sin, so that you may be the acceptable substitutionary offering to pay the sin debt for all who believe. We give you thanks for that, what you've done. And now we are forgiven and free and heaven bound because of what you've done in even moving even the faith to believe is a gift of God and so Lord uh, the gifts are amazing the uh, abundant thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift beyond our ability to fully comprehend and yet we know enough and we've experienced enough to know as you've said that one is more blessed in giving than in receiving. And so may we now bring an offering to you to support your work here on this corner as well as around the world through our missionaries, our outreach, and the gospel presentation from our own lives 
as your people. Bless this offering and use it to the furtherance of, of the gospel and that we would leave here, Lord, with deep in our souls, resonating out and, and amplified and magnified your glory before this world. Use us toward that end. Bless this offering as only you can as we give to you, uh, Heavenly Father, and give you thanks. In your glorious name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
was a declarative statement. That wasn't a wish. That wasn't a I wonder. That was a it will rise to him. All praise will rise to the Lord. And he and he alone is worthy. Thank you so much, uh, choir and uh, instrumentalists and, and all who had uh, a part in that. My, uh, I tell you, it's a, it's a blessing to, uh, to be in the same church uh, for a couple of generations uh, hearing Chuck sing. Uh, Susan, how long have you been at Redbridge? What year did you all come? 84, so uh, pushing 40 years, coming up here in a year or two, um, and uh, I love that family, love Chuck singing, and uh, such a privilege to uh, have, have been uh, serving side by side. He's our chairman of deacons, has been for uh, a number of years now, and of course, uh, Brother Saylor and I, in two weeks, I'll uh, be 29 years together on the platform and uh, together, and that's uh, such, such a blessing that, uh, to be able to have that, to share that in church life. <clears throat> Today, Father's Day, I want to bring a message from the book of Joshua, <clears throat> uh, candidly, a, a topical message, because it is Father's Day, specifically dealing with that subject of being God's leader in the home. Make no mistake about it, God has designed the husband, the father, to be the leader in the home. Um, following Moses, Joshua was that leader for the national family, leading Israel out of the wilderness and into the promised land. Um, he was the go-to guy. The buck stopped with Joshua. And men, that is the case in our homes for you and me. Even if you no longer have children in the home, such as the case with me, all of my kids are in their 30s, and so they've been out of the home for a long time. But this, uh, this uh, message, if you will, the principles in this message struck home uh, to me as much, I guess, now as ever. Because you, don't, you never stop parenting, right? You never do. And, uh, and you never stop grandparenting. Uh, in fact, uh, I've told uh, many of the uh, young adults uh, here at Redbridge, because I've seen them, uh, I, I was at the hospital in many cases shortly after some of you were born. Um, and so I feel more parental toward a lot of you than I even do pastoral. And so you never stop parenting. The similarities then between Joshua, in the, if you'll turn to the book of Joshua, in the Old Testament and how a believer's life is now, Joshua means, the word means Jehovah saves. And that's the same word from which we get Jesus. It came from that Old Testament Hebrew word, Joshua. And his physical life is analogous to the believer's spiritual life in that he was born in physical bondage in Egypt. We were born in spiritual bondage because of the depravity of man. He was miraculously delivered from bondage to freedom through the Red Sea, baptized in the Red Sea, if you will. We were miraculously delivered from bondage into freedom by spiritual baptism in Christ. Joshua had struggles in life, as do we. He experienced victory. He experienced abundant life in crossing over the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. And we experienced struggles uh, along side by side with victories until one day we cross over the final Jordan and into the presence of the Lord and so relative to the home, Joshua is a, a fitting example of being God's leader. And I want to share about a husband, a father, being Joshua in the home, being God's man in the home. If you look 
at chapter 24, the last chapter, the final chapter in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, and Brother Saylor has alluded to it uh, and, and set the table quite nicely on this first point, and this first point is this, sir, you are the prophet in your home. What do I mean by that? You've been given the ministry of instruction. That is what an Old Testament prophet did. He represented God to the people. Husband, father, you represent God to the people. That is simply God's design. You are the head of the home, 1 Corinthians 11 teaches. And similarly, Joshua was the head of the national home. And so we use that illustratively as we look at chapter 24, verses 1 through 24. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and their heads for their, and for their judges and their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the river of old, even Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward I brought you out. And now, what this chapter is, is Joshua is just reciting to all the leaders of the land the history of Israel. And I brought your fathers, verse 6, out of Egypt. And you came into the sea, and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt, and you dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan, and they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel, and set and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam, therefore he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. In other words, victory after victory after victory in the face of absolute dire consequences. God was victorious and used his leaders. Joshua being the husband, being the father of the uh, collective family of Israel was rehearsing what had happened with them. Um, and uh, in verse 11, you went over to the Jordan. And came into Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you. The Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites. But not with the sword, not with the bow. And I have given you a land uh, for which you did not labor, cities which you built not, and dwelt in them, of vineyards and olive yards which you planted not, uh, uh, did you, do you eat? Now, therefore, because of all this, now, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt and serve you the Lord. And if, you, and if it seem evil unto you this, uh, to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he is it who brought us up out, and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And who did those great signs in our sight. And preserved us in all the way wherein we went. And among all the people through whom we passed. And the, the Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites who dwelt in the land. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he had done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now, therefore, put away, said he, 
the foreign gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord your God, or the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. Joshua, not a prophet in the sense of actually technically a prophet, but he prophesied, he instructed the people. He continually gave words of instruction and exhortation to the national family. He led them as a husband. He led them as a father, as a shepherd during times of victory, in times of defeat, when they were full of faith or when they were full of fear. And dad and and grandfather and men, we are called in our families and in the church to lead in that way, to lead by way of, uh, in a prophetic way, in an instructive way, for we've been given the word and we are to know it, we are to eat it up, we are to consume it so that we might then be able to deliver it. Very recently, um, a, a situation um, occurred uh, uh, with me and Kathy, a good situation, and I said, and it just occurred to me, and I, it, sounds, it sounds pretentious, but hear it through the words of Scripture. I said, let me wash you with water from the Word, because that's exactly what Ephesians 5 commands the husband to do. Can I get a witness? And, uh, and in fact, I shared the word and shared the principle, uh, and it was as if God just enveloped. It was as if he just uh, covered and showered the whole uh, situation with his presence. Because, sir, as husband, as father, that is precisely what we are called to do and who we are called to be. Joshua instructed them in crossing over the Jordan River, in defeating Jericho, in saving Rahab, in dealing with the sin at the camp of Ai, in driving out the enemy. And so this book of Joshua is filled with instructions on following the Lord. And sir, if you know and love and follow the Lord Jesus, not only are you are, not only are you to be the spiritual leader, you can, yea, you must be that one. For no one else in your household is called to be that in the way that you are called to be that. And always called to be that. Not just when the the kids are real little. Not just as they're growing up, but all throughout. I tell you, uh, uh, I am finding, and I've I've, I've said this to to young couples, uh, uh, and you who are grandparents can identify with this. Give me an amen that the toddler years of, of parenting Those are the easy years, right? It's the years in your 40s and 50s and 60s and beyond where the the questioning and where you have to turn to God moment by moment. Those are the ones where you're saying, God, I need you. This is bigger than me. I don't have an answer. I don't know the way out, but you do. And I am calling upon you on behalf of my children and grandchildren. It's easy to direct a two-year-old, a three-year-old, you say, you don't know my two- or three-year-old, wait until he's 13, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and knows everything. Um, I was amazed when I was 18. Uh, my dad was the most unlearned, ignorant, uh, uneducated person in the history of the world. And I went right into the Navy. I got saved. And in five years when I got out of the Navy, I was blown away by how much he had learned. <laughs> Wisdom just poured into him in those years and I'm sure I am not alone in that this ministry is too big for you alone you feel inadequate welcome to the crowd but your family needs you to be near the heart of God so that you might be able to then spill out onto them to set the theological tone. Dad, someone is going to set the theological tone for your children, and not just for your toddlers, but for your adult children. Someone is going to model theology to them. It might be the theology of materialism. It may be the theology of worldliness. It may be the theology of name anything. Someone is going to model and give instruction in theology 
that is, of who God actually is, you need to be the one to give biblical theology because you are the one called to do that. You never stop parenting. You must give instruction from the Word of God. And instruction is as much caught as it is taught. You see, you give the words, as Deuter- and Mark read Deuteronomy 6, I'm alluding to it in a little while, uh, you give those words, but it also must be modeled, and not just modeled when they're three and five and seven years old. By his grace and for his glory, I trust that my oldest, at pushing age 40, uh, I, I trust, sees that modeled in my life to this day, day in, day out. In fact, he texted me this morning and said that he and his sisters are just blown away by God's goodness in me being their father. And that, oh, and he, he would not say that. That, that, was not, that was not artificial. That was genuine. That's what I want. I, 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 I long for that because I want to. I am God's prophet to the children, to the grandchildren. And sir, so are you. No one else is called to do that. You have been called to do that. And Joshua was called to do it, and by his grace and for his glory, he did just that. Again, what Mark alluded to in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, thou shalt teach them diligently. It's intentional. It is uh, uh, proactive unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them. That is the Word of God, instruction from the Word. When you sit in your house, you walk by the way, when thou liest down, when thou riseth up. You are the primary prophet, the Word of instruction from Scripture. See, you're not having to make this up along the way. You've been given the manual. I was in boot camp. They gave every one of us of the copy of the UCMJ. Anybody ever received one of those? Nobody else received a UCMJ? No wonder this country's in the shape it's in. None of you all received a UCMJ? Yeah, of course. Uniform Code of Military Justice. I did not have to figure out what I was supposed to do as someone in the armed forces. I was told what I was supposed to do, and who I was supposed to be, how I was supposed to act, how I was supposed to react, and how I wasn't supposed to do those things. Not to say that I particularly cared about that at that time. I was lost as a goose. But the fact of the matter is, I had the instruction. You've been given the instruction. The Word of God is already given for you. You are to ingest it, take it in, live it out, and pour it in to that generation God has given you. You're a prophet by way of instruction. Secondly, you're the priest in your home, having been given the ministry of intercession. And I tell you, if I succeeded, if you will, in in point A, to the same degree, I drop the ball more often than not in point B during the child-raising years. Now, you all who have kids, you're just starting. Kids are young. Maybe you're carrying a child, mom, right now. Um, You younger generation ones is what I'm saying. When I was you, I heard it from men who were me. That is, when I was 25, I heard it from the 65-year-olds. Pour yourself into calling upon the Lord on behalf of your children and grandchildren. Why did all of the 55 and 60 and 65 and 70-year-old men say that to me as a 25-year-old who knew the Word and knew it well for having been saved for just a short amount of time? Because each one of them knew the busyness of life. And uh, uh, the stresses and strains that life brings, especially with parenting, and holding down the job, and, uh, uh, and, and fending off the wolf, and shooting the buffalo, and dragging it home, and all the other things in life, would distract me from what is most important. 
And by George, I don't mind taking the king's name flippantly, it happened. Now, it, it, it didn't happen miserably, but I would say to you all who are in the 25 and 30 and 35-year-old range, by the way, any, any old guys like me identify with that counsel that you heard it when you were young and you heeded it to some degree or not, and my, you wish now that you would have been, that would have been riveted. You would have been, you would have been nailed to the wall with that principle that you are the family priest. And no one else is called to be that one in your home. You are called to be that one in your home. You see, a prophet represents God to the people. You tell the people about God. A priest represents the people to God. You tell God about the people. You see, when you open the word with your children and grandchildren, you're the prophet. You're saying, thus saith the Lord. But when you're the priest, you're saying, Lord, I need you. I can't change a heart. I don't know what to do with my three-year-old, my 13-year-old, my 23-year-old, and keep on going. And then the next generation of grandchildren come up. Martin, I'm going to pick on you. Stand up, show me your shirt. I saw this today. Just stand there. Let me read it. Martin Hall's shirt says, let me get close enough. Husband, I like the order of importance there. Dad, Grandpa, Great Grandpa, oh, God, give me enough years. <laughs> Protector, Hero. We'll get to Hero in a second. Uh, but Protector. How will you protect them? You can't be with them 24 7. I sent my son off to war. I can't be with him. I, I can't always be, sent daughters off to marriage. And yet, the greatest protection I can offer is God's protection. And I don't just say that because it sounds syrupy spiritual, but actual. You see, when you work, you work. But when you pray, God works. <laughs> Did anybody hear what I just said? When you work, you work. But when you pray, genuinely, before the Lord, bowed before Him, needing Him, desperate for Him, then He moves in and takes care of business. That's a pretty good deal. And I, you know I'm not pragmatic. I'm just saying that that is what... Is it. And you young dads need to hear that. Now, don't you be telling me in 40 years, because <clears throat> I'll be 105 and I'll have a hard time hearing you, <laughs> that you heard me challenge you in this way and all that I, don't even tell me. I'll dog slap you all day if you tell me that. Because you've heard it now. Just like I heard it then. And I heeded it to some degree, but I'm heeding it a whole lot more today than I did then. Why? Maybe I'm listening better to wise counsel. Maybe school of hard knocks. Maybe maturity. Maybe believing God is bigger than I ever have believed that he is. I don't know the, all the whys. All I know that is I was told, pled with, to be the priest. Telling, I'm going to be a tattletale on my children to God. And them knowing that you are telling God about them. Because your heart is burdened for their souls. Joshua didn't hold the office of a priest. 
but he certainly interceded that way. It's the whole book is Joshua communing with the Lord. Where did he learn that? Primarily from Moses. <clears throat> he understood. Joshua understood the principle later given in Psalm 27, verses 1 through 4. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Now, Dad, Grandpa, ask yourself. Do my children and grandchildren, through the, the, the lens of which they're viewing me, is this what they see in me? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Joshua knew God, and he knew God was faithful. He and Caleb were the two spies who went in and said, God will do what he has promised. The other ten voted no. And still Joshua remained faithful. Sir, you are God's leader in the home, crying out to the Lord on behalf of your wife, your children, your grandchildren. I asked Brother Dave Wallace to sing this song, but he's in the nursery <coughs> serving children, and he wasn't, I didn't want to ask to displace him or anything right now, so here are the words. He sings, pray for the children, pray for their future, pray for the days that lie ahead, for soon they will be out of your reach. Parents, can I get an amen? They grow up overnight, don't they? My oldest is pushing 40 years old. What? Where did that go? Brother Wayne Scott, where did the last 40 years go? Soon they will be out of your reach. But they'll never escape all the prayers that you said. Because when you work, you work. When you pray, God works. And so you can, yea, you must intercede. Be the family priest. Yes, you know the Word of God, and you give instruction as a prophet. But equally and possibly more important, depending upon any given man, you know the God of the Word, and you bring intercession on behalf of your children. And you don't stop until your last breath. Until your last breath. May it be, as the Apostle John said in 3 John and verse 4, with my dying breath, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. I mean, is there any greater joy than that? John said no. And that is accomplished as much as in any other way. through relentless storming the throne of grace, saying, help God. I might just start preaching before we're done here. Thirdly, and of course it's alliterated, sir, you're the president in your home, having been given the ministry of inspiration. Look at chapter 1. Again, you're using Joshua as that template, as that example, as that prototype. Look at the first chapter of Joshua, very quickly if you would. Joshua chapter 1. You all with physical Bibles, rustle the leaves so I can hear that. Thank you. It helps me so much. 
Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. To save my voice, I'll skip down to verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land, which I swore, this is God talking to Joshua, unto their fight. He's commissioning him. He's saying, you're the leader. You're the president. You demand. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses thy servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper wherever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy wife prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee wherever thou goest. Joshua was the president to the people. He was told by the Lord of how to inspire them to follow. Being the president in your home means that you're the one ultimately responsible. The buck stops with you. We don't see many in our day. Oh, my, is it not. Were it not for the truth of Scripture, which absolutely sets us on the right path and the only right path, you, you're tempted to dismay, to be in despair in our day. For every voice out there in the world is against, hates the family, hates the biblical family. Every philosophy, I, I mean really, every one, short uh, uh, of something that is just neutral vanilla, doesn't mean anything. Everything that's being pushed at us in our culture, in this day, is upside down and backwards when it comes to the family. Namely, of what even a human is. What is a woman? A Supreme Court justice could not say what a woman is. And schools giving, being mandated, if not even openly willing, to teach every abominable issue that man has ever dreamt up. I shouldn't, I probably ought to retract that because I'm sure given enough time and effort, there can be more abomination, even greater abomination. Probably will be in our lifetime. The home needs inspiration, needs someone to model what it means to be responsible before the Lord. I have grown more than weary of every president of the U.S., no matter the party, seemingly for multiple, multiple, I, I, I guess Harry, leave it to somebody from Missouri. The buck stops here, right here on my desk. I'm responsible. I don't know if there's hardly been, maybe not one, since then, taking all the accolades, highlighting the positive of my administration, even if it's fictitious, and blaming the negatives on an outside cause or the predecessor. That doesn't inspire anyone for anything sir you can you must inspire wife and children to follow your example and that presupposes you you are leading by example in humbly following the Lord he it is who is God and I am his humble subject his child his devoted follower. And in the home, in, in the family, I'm the prophet in giving instruction. I'm the priest in bringing intercession because my shoulders aren't big enough to carry this weight. And God didn't intend that to be the case. He wanted us to cry out to him, to cast our care upon him, 1 Peter 5, 7. And I'm the president in that I'm to be the inspiring leader. Joshua was just that. 
Why is that? How is it? Because he was full of God's wisdom. Deuteronomy 34, 9, and Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. I like to think of spiritual wisdom as the capacity to properly apply biblical knowledge. You see, Joshua had a storehouse of knowledge. The Spirit of God inspired him to write this book. He knew Moses better than anyone who wrote the first five books. So he had a lot of, uh, Job had already been written. He had a lot of biblical information and knowledge. So he could instruct. What's more, he had an intimate walk with the Lord. A, a, a moment by moment, I need you, God. This is too big for me. He had a ministry of intercession. Because of that, his life was credible, and he could inspire others to follow the Lord. I close with this. A phrase, a verse from a song written by a former Red Bridger years and years ago called The Opus, O-P-U-S, which means the work. And I'm inspired when I hear the words of this song like I'm inspired by the words of Joshua. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Or, 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 or uh, of Elijah, how long halt you between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If not, then just live for the devil. But if he is Lord, then serve him. I'm inspired by that. I'm invigorated by that. <clears throat> and the, the verse in the song says this. The great play of history is still going on. You could, you could pl- put that in your own life with your family. It's still going on. You're here breathing in your right mind. It's still going on. You still have the children, the grandchildren, the people you can influence. You say, well, I'm single here, or I've not had children. Well, then pick out a child and tattle to God on him or on her. And bring her, make it your life project to do just that. Your life passion, better stated, to do just that. But the reality is the great play of history This drama is still unfolding. It's still going on. The choir of creation is still singing their song. The heavens are still declaring the glory of God. You see it every day. Last night, Kathy and I were at Starlight Theater, Midtown, seeing a wonderful presentation of Celtic dancing. I signed up for lessons immediately following And they had a a giant screen of the moon absolutely covered, it's a picture, covered with tens of thousands of dots of lights. And in the middle uh, of the men and ladies, you know, doing doing the Celtic dancing and everything, it's just mesmerizing when they do that. Uh, I I said, I, I pointed up the screen. And I whispered at her, I said, he made the stars also. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Now, that inspires me to want to go out and build a building or or tear one down or, or do something for his glory. Because he made the stars also. And he's called me as prophet, priest, and president, the leader in the home. So the great play of history is still going on. The choir of creation is still singing their song. The opus, the work of God, is still being rehearsed. And you may contribute a verse. We all may contribute a verse. So on the musical score of that song of history. You're given the pen 
and you're writing on that. And would to God you would write with me as I have at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, wrote down on a little torn off piece of paper a commitment to intercede for my family, folded it up, stuck it in a crevice in the Wailing Wall. Say, is that magical? Absolutely not. But it was a stake in the ground moment. You nail the stake in the ground saying, this is where I am. Maybe better stated, this is where I need to be. And so that drama is still being written in your life. Would you say, could you say, God, by your grace and for your glory, I am going to ramp up, start, increase, intentional, giving instruction as prophet in my family to my grandchildren. Years ago, I began to discipleship ministry tools. The first one I called Dad's Discipleship. My son and sons-in-law. Very small group. Just us. And I wrote many, many emails, devotional emails. Son, son son-in-law, this is what you're going to face in life. This is what I faced. You're in that season right now. On and on and on. And then... I created one called Millennial Meditations. And it was for all the millennial age guys in my family, almost all of whom were nephews. Maybe all of whom were nephews. My nephews, Kathy's nephews, and the nephews from my late wife's family. And wrote them devotions along the same sort of thing. And guess what happened with all the great intentions in the world to be the prophet to them. I don't know if anybody else was being the prophet to these guys. Maybe so, maybe not. To be the priest. To be the president, i.e. inspirer. Guess what happened? I got busy along the way. Wrote many, many, many of them haven't written one 18 months, 24 months, something like that. It will happen to you. This message will go in one ear and out the other. This message, you will leave here saying, preacher, I was convicted. I was then do something about it. Because the story of creation, is, the song is still being sung. The drama is still unfolding. By his grace and for his glory, I will be that prophet. Meaning, I will be given, giving instruction day in, day out, week in, week out to all. And then you just identify who it is. I don't know who it is. You know who it is. I will be. Not I can be. I should be. I might be. I will be that priest in the family, the intercessor. I will be that president in the one who can set the tone, that others will say, look at dad, look at grandpa, look at whoever that relationship is to you, uncle. And I will model what it means to follow the Lord. You may contribute a verse. We all may contribute a verse. Lord, uh, profoundly easy to preach this. Equally profoundly difficult to live this. And yet, Joshua did. He was just a guy. Elijah did. And he was a man subject to like passions as we are, as James 5 tells us. So may we, in fact, be strong in the Lord 
and in the power of his might and live out our days with children, grandchildren, and any others who need instruction, intercession, and inspiration. May we be that to this next generation. God, they need someone to talk about, to model the way of life. May we be those in our day, Joshua's in our day, for your glory, Lord. For if it's not for your glory, then it's just, it's just noise. Burden our hearts. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, just in the quietness of this moment. And just as I put that prayer, sheet of paper, a piece of paper, in the crevice of the wall in Jerusalem, how many would say by uplifted hand, to the Lord, and just giving evidence to me that you mean business, my heart is drawn toward being that instructor, that intercessor, that inspirer in our day, all my days, in the lives of my children and grandchildren. Are there any here who would say, that is me. I am signing on. God bless you. Afresh and anew. God, I mean business. Lord, I'm not just going to hear about it. Not just going to wish it, but this is a solemn vow. Don't make a vow to God that is not genuine and real. But there's a new day right now, Lord, with you. In this arena, I'm going to be Joshua to those under my influence who see me or the, uh, over whom I can have a ministry and an influence. Anybody else? That is me. I am committing in a fresh and a new way. God bless you all. Lord, do something eternal in this time, in our lives. And we'll give you thanks for all eternity. Amen. We're going to stand now and turn to hymn number 476. Be strong in the Lord. Our deacons will be down front. Maybe this is a time for you to come and pray. Maybe this is a, a time that you don't even know if you know the Savior. And we want to share salvation with you and pray with you. You come. Maybe you're in need of a church home. This is where you know God would uh, have you uh, jump in and serve Him. You come. Number 476, as we sing, you respond as the Lord is burdening your heart. Be strong in the Lord. Come now. As the Lord stirring in your heart, you come. As the eagle ascending, victory is sure when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for he is your guide. back at 6 p.m. for a message in 1 Peter about offering a spiritual sacrifice unto the Lord. Don't forget, two weeks on Sunday, July 3rd, unlike what the bulletin says, it is July 3rd, morning, Sunday school morning service, immediately followed by lunch, a dinner on the grounds, old-fashioned dinner on the grounds, just like churches have had throughout the ages, out the pavilion, and then it'd be activities, fellowship, games, and the like. And then that will dis will dismiss from there. We will not have an evening service in two weeks. Win teams this Wednesday. See you back tonight, Brother Sailor.
for the cause of Christ the King. We give our lives an offering till all the earth resounds with ceaseless praise to the sun. For the cause of Christ we go with joy to reap, with faith to sow, as many see and many put their trust in the sun.